All right, we begin this Colby Senamar in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, and Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, share screen here. Okay. Everyone can see that? Okay. All right, so continuing from where we left off last time, um, I'm gonna go into now the structure and method of theology according to Bonaventure's itinerarium, which uh, according to Father Peter, St. Maximilian Colby bases his, uh, his theology off of. So this is just more of a general overview. Um, but basically the itinerarium or the journey of the mind to God, it's a seven step process. I mean, technically it's three steps with some sub steps, but to make it simpler, it's seven steps. And uh, it's tracing the logical development of acquired contemplation, uh, culminating in step seven with infused contemplation. Um, and so acquired contemplation obviously is just more the active initiative of the thinker, whereas infused contemplation is more passive and the, the direct knowledge that God is, is given to the soul where there's can be forms of ecstasy and rapture and, and things like that. Uh, but what Father Peter wants to say is that steps uh, one through six, or the three steps with each sub-step, um, pertains to the proper academic mode of theology, which is the mode of thinking which is proper to direct knowledge of God in this world, and what we're able to know about God through symbols, through signs, through sacraments, through words and concepts, and... Um, then we get to step seven, where we have the contemplative or mystical mode of theology. And this is the mode of thinking, which is proper to the knowledge of God in heaven. And uh, when we're talking about uh, our knowledge here, it's dealing with, we're obviously talking about the, the mystic here, the one who's transcended uh, the merely proper or academic mode of doing theology. And now he's uh, receiving a higher form of uh, infused knowledge, which is not contentless or anti-propositional, but is something that can be converted or translated into academic theology or into concepts and analogies that we can understand that which, you know, was received by, by the mystic. And obviously for, for Bonaventure, the goal of our life uh, as journeying towards God, as returning home to the Father, this reditus, the goal is to um, reach this life of mystical union with God. That's the whole purpose of the itinerarium modeled off of Francis is to, um, to reach that stage. And um, so this general background of the itinerarium is gonna be influential for, uh, for St. Maximilian Kolbe. And then, um, so the, th the three major steps in the normal process of knowing God in proper theology with each step subdivided into two sub steps. So Father Peter mentions that the reason for these steps and subdivisions is precisely because the finite mind cannot know God immediately, but only via some created medium or sign, which is in part caused by the reality known, that is to say the object and in part caused by the activity of the mind itself or the subject. Um, so because we do not have an, uh, a direct immediate vision of God, we need these mediums or signs, um, uh, in order to know God and, um, essentially what this process of the journey of mind, to, of the mind to God is, is your, your beginning with medium, the medium or sign of creatures or the vestige moving on to the medium or sign of the image and what it's constituted of, 
and then going beyond that to the similitude or as Bonaventure will say to the name of God first as being and then as good but we need these mediums or signs to be able to contemplate God and it just goes to show to the analogical content of revelation because we don't have intuitive uh, knowledge of the divine essence and um, father, uh, so Basically, as you guys know from the itinerarium, Bonaventure says that God is known as a cause in two different ways. And it's either by knowledge of the effect through creatures or in creatures. Um, so <clears throat> step, you know, in dividing the steps, you'll have, for instance, step one is divided into the knowledge of God through creatures and then in creatures. Um, and then for the image, it's the knowledge of God through the image and in the image. And finally, the knowledge of God through his name and in his name. And in particular, when, we, when we're talking about the knowledge of God in creatures, this happens by way of what Bonaventure calls contuition or by contuiting the power of God in the effects uh, in both the natural and the supernatural orders. And um, <clears throat> So for just a brief example, for knowledge of God through creatures, this would be, for example, knowing, coming to know God's power, wisdom, and goodness through the creature. And then um, when we're talking about knowledge of God in the creature, I, I think what Bonaventure is getting at is now we're having a more particular, uh, or we can more particularly um, recognize the Trinitarian dimension of the vestige so that everything that comes forth from God has a Trinitarian character. And so now uh, when, when we're transitioning from through to in, it's more of a, um, it's more of a, a, a higher knowledge of God. And I think this is why Father Peter will say that grace typically prevails in contuitive knowledge. And then, um, so this is, there's a little bit of a development here, but not too much from what I just said previously. But first, like I said, we have the knowledge of God through and in the vestige. And by a vestige, obviously, he just means a, a non-rational creature. So something that's not man, you know, or, or an angel. So, for example, a cat that some way through contemplating the cat, uh, I can have uh, some form of knowledge of God. And I can either know God through the cat or by contuiting his effects in the cat. Same thing with the knowledge of God now in the next steps of knowledge of God through the image. And by image here, we're talking about a rational creature um, or man. And um, so in this stage, I'm, <clears throat> it's kind of a, a mode of interiorizing where I'm beginning to reflect and have knowledge of God through, through oneself as image. And so here, for example, you have man being created in the Trinitarian image, right? With memory, intellect, and will for Bonaventure following the Augustinian psychology. And that through a interiorizing and reflecting on oneself and one's own um, spiritual acts and processes from into, uh, intellection to volition, you're coming to have a, a knowledge of the way God himself operates in an inner Trinitarian dimension. And then finally, uh, and I could be mistaken on this, but I, I, I'm not sure if <laughs> this is knowledge of God through and in the similitude. I kind of assume that by way of extension, but I know Bonaventure is focusing in particular on God's name. Um, so if I, if I am wrong, I apologize on that. But uh, Bonaventure says at this stage, after reflecting on, uh, after gaining knowledge from without oneself and extra mental reality through creatures, and then moving to knowledge of God through oneself in the image, I then move above myself and I'm able to contemplate God as above myself and gain knowledge of him in this way. And through this, I have to refer to concepts that we use to describe God analog uh, in an analogical way. So uh, Bonaventure begins by reflecting on being and through being, um, you're able to... Um, Con uh, contemplate all these things about God that are related to being um, in particular here, infinite being. And then um, I'm able to move on there um, from being to good, which is a, a higher way I, of knowing God. 
and this is dealing with God's self-communicative goodness and um, his pouring out of himself um, upon creatures and, um, and things like that. But each step in this process consists in a progressively higher knowledge of God. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, nature prevails in knowing God through material creatures, spiritual creatures in the name of God. Whereas when I'm dealing with contuition, Father Peter says that grace prevails in knowing uh, or contuiting God in material creatures, spiritual creatures, and the name of God. And there's a, Father Peter points out that in particular, when we're talking about contuition and why it's, um, uh, or what's so important when we're speaking about contuition is that it, it has this aspect of personal judgment uh, or what Newman would call the exercise of the illative sense as the key to a real or personal ascent, which is ultimately the flip side of abstraction. Now, this personal judgment is required to know God in creatures. So you might say that when I have knowledge of God through creatures, it's coming through the process of abstraction. You know, I abstract the, uh, um, I, I guess I, I go through the regular process of abstraction, which turns into a phantasm, which illumines the sensible species, intelligible, intelligible species of so that whole dynamic where I'm abstracting a universal concept from something that's singular. So when I'm knowing God through creatures, whether they're material, spiritual, or through his name, it's primarily the emphasis is on abstraction. But in particular, uh, Father Peter wants to point out that when we're transitioning from step one to step two, or from step three to step four, step five to step six, and contuition is taking place, personal judgment is, is involved here in a particular way. Um, that there's a real personal ascent, a personal dimension to, to the knowledge that I have. And um, as a kind of conclusion with that, uh, without this personal judgment for pa Father Peter, there, there can be no advancement from step one to step two, and by extension, three to four, that uh, this personal judgment is a, a key factor in the element of contuition. And then this is kind of a, I guess a side note towards uh, one of the ends of the sections here, but he's relating the Marian vow of total consecration to the journey of the mind to God. And um, from my reading of it, the way I saw was that steps one and two are knowledge of God through creatures is related to the vow of poverty. Steps three and four are knowledge of God through and in the image is related to the vow of obedience. And then steps five and six, ultimately leading into to seven, uh, to the seventh step of infused contemplation is related to the vow of chastity. So relative to knowledge of God in and through creatures, he kind of gives like just a brief definition of what he means by poverty and then later on by obedience and chastity. And then he relates it to uh, the Franciscan, the vows of Franciscan life as Marianized and, and, and what that does relative to the vows. Um, so poverty in the first place has to do with detachment from material things so as to hope in something more where hope describes first of all a desire for god as well as a love for learning and then so franciscan poverty then is going to be the maxima maximization of this desire when it's marianized so obviously as we know when we're speaking about marianized franciscan poverty on the one hand what we're just saying is living poverty the way that Mary does, but more concretely and practically, we're talking about unlimited consecration to Our Lady and being totally possessed by Mary and having and offering all our, our, our material and spiritual goods, offering our very faculties and being so stripped and so poor, totally belonging to her and being possessed by her, that we achieve a maximization of poverty. And um, when this poverty is reached, because the soul is detached from creatures, which is primarily what we're talking about, material creatures uh, in steps one and two. Um, when that detachment is perfect, you might say, um, then the soul is fully desiring and moving towards God and towards the possession of him um, so that he can totally cling to him and attach to him. So 
there's a very the journey of the mind to god is obviously it, it's it it's theology and spirituality right it's not just this kind of like intellectual ascent divorced from any sort of spirituality it's 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 really that that knowledge of god through and in material creatures is conjoined with exercising the virtue and ultimately the uh or even more perfectly you might say the vow of poverty and that through the ex exercising of that poverty i'm not just having knowledge of god but i'm actually desiring him and loving him through this very ascent um now in in moving to knowledge of god in and through the image related to the vow of obedience uh father peter says Obedience has to do with personal humility, without which introspection remains fixated on self rather than on God, who is our Savior, Jesus. So in exercising obedience or the obedience of faith, when I turn in, I either turn in and encounter myself or I encounter God. Um, and if I'm not humble, if I'm prideful, I'll only find myself and it'll end in darkness, despair, doubt, skepticism. However, if I turn within and I'm humble to the light and I acknowledge God's presence, and I acknowledge that light, then I will encounter him, and I'll, I'll encounter God as a, um, not even just as judge, but as, as, as a personal savior, and um, so this is, this sentence here is a bit uh, deep and abstract, but I, I, kind of, I put it in there to get the idea of when I wanted to translate to Franciscan obedience right below it. So he says the perfect judgment or philosophical resolution. So the plena resolutia Bonaventure where everything is reduced to uh, theology uh, accounting for the contingent is bound up with the obedience of faith and obedience, which interiorizes the external or corporal mortification or personal annihilation of poverty leading to perfect personalization. So ultimately Franciscan obedience is going to be maximizing this divine personalization when it is Marianized. Um, in other words, without this obedience of faith, without this act of humility, without um, really interiorizing um, the exterior, internalizing exterior uh, mortification and really um, um, making it something personal and not just like this isolated thing, but really a, a personal effort and a, a personal commitment to Christ. Without that, I, there, there, there's no personalization. Um, in order to be person to be truly personalized, there has to be this um, this relational element, and there has to be an interiorizing of what's exterior. Um, whether it takes the form of knowledge leading to a personal judgment, will it, whether it takes the form of doing. Um, penance and austerity, if that doesn't lead to like a, uh, any, a deeper interiorization and encounter with God and a deeper spirituality, it's going to seem like it's in vain. It's, it's going to seem to depersonalize me in a real way. If there's no like judgment joined with it, if there's no interiorizing of that dimension, it's just going to be like I'm doing penance and austerity for its, its own sake. And it's going to leave me kind of lifeless and empty inside. So authentic Franciscan obedience, um, when Marianized, really ultimately humanizes and personalizes the individual. And this is related to, once again, knowledge in and through the image. Um, steps five and six, then, uh, Father Peter relates to the vow of chastity, here chastity pertaining to knowledge of God that is above oneself, and a knowledge perfected only when via infused contemplation it is found within rather than circling about charity. So that's why I kind of included step seven uh, in here because it's the purpose of contemplative chastity is ultimately to lead to infused contemplation. And it's ultimately about cultivating the absolute purity of heart whereby one can see God. Um, and, uh, Obviously, we know we can only do that in the ultimate vision of God, but infused contemplation is like a transitory experience, um, at least through ecstasy, of, um, of that vision, a more a kind of more, uh, I don't know if right phrases to say intuitive cognition, um, but um, so knowledge of God above oneself through and in the creature um, in order to really 
be able to contemplate God as being and good. I have to be pure. I have to be exercising chastity. If, if not, you might say those concepts to some extent will be obscured or they, uh, my, my, my contemplation of them will not be uh, as pure and, and um, give me as perfect a truth. And then when he says infused contemplation is circling around charity, obviously this is, this is just a distinction of a, of a primarily intellectual contemplation that is not fully within charity, but is kind of distant and still without it. And a, a contemplation that's, that's constituted by charity itself, that this super eminent knowledge of Christ that comes about through affection and through love. So more of an effective contemplation is what's at stake with, in, with infused which ultimately leads to a, a higher knowledge. So it's not anti-intellectual. And this occurs when one is totally transubstantiated into the immaculate and so into the Holy Spirit. So by extension, Franciscan chastity then is a maximization of the knowledge of God as above oneself when it is fully Marianized. So that's how Father Peter's pretty much tying this, the Col Colby's Marian vow and basing it in, in the itinerarium and showing the relation between the journey of the mind to God, but also living um, the life of a religious. And then I'm not going to comment much on this. This constituted probably a good eight pages of the book, maybe six to eight pages, but I just basically summarized it because he had big block quotes from a St. Maximilian, which I, I didn't want to add in. But the whole point of this section was that there's evidence of St. Maximin's scatistic approach in his projected book. And basically, Father Peter just points out four key features of Scotus's thesis concerning the absolute primacy of Christ that are found in the writings of Colby. And what I gather is that Father Peter is just trying to demonstrate the scotistic influence on Colby. He's trying to conf confirm that the fundamental basis for understanding Colby is in this Bonaventure and scotistic uh, position because it's not as if Colby sat down and he's writing like detailed theological works uh, on Bonaventure and Scotus. So you might say it takes a little more digging to, or at least um, where there's not explicit quotes all the time or uh, explicit articles like Scotus used university of being, <laughs> you know, Colby didn't exactly do that. So he's trying to show how these points that Colby himself is developing, they, they demonstrate this scotistic background as, as, as the best way to understand Colby. So the first is the predestination of Mary to be queen of creation before any consideration of Adam's fall. And, you know, Father Peter is obviously aware that Scotus himself does not directly speak of the predestination of Mary, but the principles he laid out relative to predestination and to the absolute primacy of Christ, it just follows logically from his thought as Scotus's disciples did to extend that to the predestina predestination of Mary. Um, and then once again, before any consideration of sin, because the mode of the absolute primacy of Christ, the mode of the incarnation is Marian. The second is the trial of the angels in terms of acceptance or rejection of Christ and Mary. So this is something that Colby writes about, I think, more than once where uh, the, the trial of the angels and the reason why they fell ultimately was in pride, rejecting to submit themselves to uh, Christ and Mary as the king and queen of, of creation. And this is something that has a scotistic basis. And I think it's something you'll find in Mother of Agrita's contemplative Mariology as well. Um, Third, the decided preference for referring to Christ as the man God when the core of a discussion centers about the salvation of the created world uh, while maintaining reference to Christ as God man. Did I switch those? No. Okay. While maintaining reference to Christ as God man when the subject matter centers about the Trinity within itself. So uh, essentially, this shows a scotistic influence because, um, as we know, Scotus holds the absolute predestination of the word to be incarnate. So he would speak as all things being created, not just through the eternal word or the verbum eternum, but the incarnate word or the verbum incarnatum, whereas Bonaventure would only speak about the incarnate word um, and uh, 
in terms of the reparation of the world or in, in terms of redemption. So uh, in a, so for instance, in a, you might say in a pre-fall context for Bonaventure, the eternal word would be the primary teacher um, and the incarnate word becomes the primary teacher in a post-fall when talking about uh, reparation and redemption. Whereas for Scotus, it's the incarnate word the whole way. So by referencing the man God when speaking about salvation of the created order and then God man when, when speaking about the subject matter of the Trinity within itself, Colby's trying to say that the whole of the created order, the salvation of the created world is to be considered prior to redemption. And thus it, it is permeated with Christ. He's the very center of it prior to any consideration of sin. Um, and then uh, fourth, the incarnation is ordered primarily to the maximal glory of God in the form of the maximal enjoyment of God's love. And so once again, this is another Scotistic theme because uh, Scotus does not believe the primary motive of the incarnation was the redemption of the fall, but, it, but so that a human nature could enjoy maximally to the fullness God's uh, infinite love. And that's the only reason there's no other, there's no, it's not occasioned by anything. It's not uh, some kind of uh, natural necessity just flowing forth from God, but it's just rooted in who he is as love. And it's an end for, for itself. And everything is ordered to that end, namely to Christ and by extension, Mary. So this maximal glory then will ultimately rest uh, in this context on both the grace of the incarnation and immaculate conception. So these four scotistic themes are pervasive in Colby's uh, work. And then uh, the next section Father Peter discusses is entitled a metaphysical hermeneutic. I am the immaculate conception. And so this is going to be ultimately probably what we can all understand easily is that this is ultimately going to be one of the biggest influences of St. Maximilian Kolbe and of what Father Peter draws out from him relative to our theology and even our metaphysics. And ultimately, the, the scotistic core uh, of Kolbe and theology and metaphysics here is, whereas Scotus, you know, in his, uh, what is it, the De Primo Principio, De Rerum Primo Principio, emphasizes in particular God's re revelation of himself as the the I am who am of God and by extension, the I am of Jesus in the New Testament. And so ultimately this is the I am of the ends infinitum seu divinum or um, of infinite or divine being. And so the unique contribution now of St. Maximilian Kolbe building off what Our Lady revealed um, to St. Bernadette as really a form of dogmatic metaphysics is that I am the immaculate conception of Mary and not the merely the fact that Mary was immaculately conceived that defines her very finite essence. Um, and so the I am of the ens finitum perfecte divinizatum seus spiritualizatum. So finite being as perfectly divinized or spiritualized. And I think that's also an important point because it's not just finite being like in, in, in the abstract sense, it's really finite being as utterly perfected as being quasi infinite. But what this puts us, what, what this ultimately allows for now is, well, we know that SCOTUS divides theology into necessary and contingent theology. And we know that necessary theology is centered upon God as infinite being or the I am who am. But now when it comes to contingent theology, uh, which is, we might say in particular centered upon Jesus, the incarnation and Mary um, with the immaculate conception. Um, it's giving now a, a, a Marian colored, once again, like we talked about in the last lecture to all of contingent theology, because just as God is infinite being, so Mary is the perfection of finite being, at least in terms of finite personhood, because we can also bring in the human nature of Christ, but Christ is not a finite person. He's a divine person with a finite human nature, but Our Lady is finite in the fullest possible extent, even pertaining to her personhood. Um, so what I kind of fleshed out was that to me, because, um, this division of necessary and contingent theology um, 
Father Peter constantly roots in the, in the basis of the univocal concept of being with its two intrinsic modes, infinite and finite. So in a real sense, Christ is the link between necessary and contingent, in, and contingent theology in virtue of the grace of the hypostatic union, because he's got the two natures, one infinite, one finite or divine and human united in the person of the word. So the, uh, in virtue of his human nature um, uh, in, the, in the incarnation that covers the finite relative to contingent theology and then the divine nature, the infinite relative to uh, necessary theology. So he, he, he links necessary and contingent theology in a unique way. But as Scotus is wont to say that the word or Christ is not the primary object of contingent theology because that would leave out uh, many other things like the Holy Spirit and his mission, the fact that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit create. Uh, he distances himself a bit from Bonaventure who says that the whole Christ, um, Christ and his body are the primary object, are the, I guess, the primary object of contingent theology. Um, but Scotus wants to extend that to leave room ultimately for these other aspects other than Christ, you know, like the Holy Spirit, creation, and uh, all other kinds of things. And so I think that's important, the extent, the expansion, as it were, of contingent theology, because now it shows really, in order to understand contingent theology, it has to be rooted in what necessary theology, and therefore the two processions, and by extension in contingent theology, the two missions. So it can't just be about Christ, um, cause he, yes, he is the, the, the termination of the mission of the word, but then you also have our lady as the primary visible term of the mission of the Holy spirit. So she, um, in reflecting the Holy spirit is, is intimately a part of, uh, contingent theology. So I added here that Mary is the co-link between necessary and contingent theology, kind of like she's the co-head with Christ in virtue of the grace of the immaculate conception. And this is ultimately uh, rooted in Colby's teaching on the created and uncreated immaculate conception. And so Mary being the quasi incarnation of the Holy Spirit. Now we're doing, dealing with two persons, one infinite, one finite and two natures, one infinite and one finite. Um, and this is particularly a personification in another person, not a subsistence in a second nature. So the Holy Spirit doesn't subsist in our lady in terms of like uh, his termination. Uh, it's just, it, it's just a matter of divine indwelling and acceptance. Um, but so just as Christ with the uh, one person, infinite and finite, so too Our Lady, but in union with the Holy Spirit, we have the same reflection of infinite and finite with further distinctions because Mary's only the quasi incarnation of the spirit. But this, uh, I don't want to talk too much more because I know I'm taking forever, but this is from what I gather, probably the most e e expansive or broad or important means for our necessary and contingent theology. So uh, Father Peter then goes into a discussion pretty much of just Scotus's university of being. It's pretty much a, a heavily philosophical discussion so I, I know you guys are aware of the univocal concept of being, so I'll just kind of summarize uh, quickly what Father Peter talks about. So the univocal concept of being together with its intrinsic disjunctive mode, so infinite and finite, is not simply another concept. Um, and, and this for two reasons, according to Father Peter. On the one hand, being as a concept enjoys a certain incomparability. All other concepts can be compared to it and ultimately in Bonaventurian terms reduced to it. But as such, the univocal concept of being cannot be compared to any other concepts um, because comparing with Bonaventure, like light, from, like light from which the concept of divine illumination derives, it falls into no category. So the Bonaventurian light that's the basis for divine illumination is just the first thing that's enlightening the mind it's not it's it's so that the intellect is functioning in an on not off mode it's just like turning the on button for the intellect to function properly and this light is not 
it's not comparable with anything else. It, it's, it's, uh, it's just the condition for being able to, to, for the finite intellect to function properly. And so the same thing is being, it doesn't fall into any category. It's like, it just almost like something that a light that just drops into the mind. And it's the basis by which I can even reason further. Uh, and then later I can distinguish between finite and infinite, but as such being is, is neither as a concept that falls into the mind. Um, and so Father Peter says that being as a concept considered apart from its modes corresponds to no specific extra mental reality. So when I when I'm when he's talking about the univocal concept of being, it's not it's not relative to any one individual particular being outside the mind. It's not this tree in front of me or this cat in front of me, which are both finite beings because they're further they're further qualified as finite. So this is just a being which enables me to then ultimately come to know finite and infinite being in a particular way. So it's for Scotus, it's semantic or conceptual and not uh, metaphysical. Uh, so the univocal concept of being is according to Father Peter is not merely regulatory and it is not empty content wise and therefore meaningless. So this is a pretty common critique actually. I was just reading a book not too long ago, someone discussing Scotus's univocal concept of being. And the first thing he says is, it is empty. It has no content. So it's, it's obviously something that Father Peter's addressing because it's, it's a common mistake. And um, that's why he's drawing it out here. So he, in order to rectify this misconception that the univocal concept of being is empty and meaningless and just, you know, performing a regulatory function. Um, he says, we must consider the univocal concept of being as the conceptual form of divine illumination at the natural level of human existence, without which no creature can be set apart as an image rather than a mere vestige of God. So once again, that was just comparing the univocal concept of being to the light which comes in from divine illumination. It's what enables one to be an image rather than a vestige because it enables me to be capable of understanding. Um, and thus we should understand Scotus's notion of being neither as primarily regulative nor as primarily being the motive object, which reflects an extra mental finite reality, but in Bonaventurian terminology as the fontal object, what Scotus calls the proper object of the human intellect as such, the human intellect being a, a simply simple perfection. So this is just kind of a retouching of what he stated earlier. Um, in the comparison between the motive and the, the fontal object, but now he's just specifying it in relate to the univocal concept of being. So I won't really stretch it out. And then uh, to just kind of finish up the, the you know, univocity of being, um, one characteristic is, that, characteristic is that if being as such is the proper object of the intellect, then no intellect can be determined to and by its motive object. object except to the extent that being itself is the prime determinant or cause of this determination in the form of an act characteristic of various finite intellects. So essentially, I take that object. It's not determined by the quiddities of uh, sensible objects, right? If it were, it, you'd have a very tough time explaining how you can have any knowledge of something metaphysical, anything which transcends uh, the physical uh, or sense material things. And so he's basically saying that <clears throat> it's not the quiddities or the essences of material things that, that determines the intellect. Rather, it's, it's insofar as this material thing has being and in a finite form. So it's, it's ultimately, it's being itself that, that's the prime determinant or cause um, of the intellect's function. It's not the actual um, uh, essence of a material thing, because if it was determined to that, uh, then Scotus would probably say that this kind of collapses any of our, our knowledge of God, our ability to go beyond uh, uh, the, uh, the sensible without an actual change itself to the, uh, the finite intellect. Um, 
And um, so once again, this is just relating to either the source of light via an immediate presence, Bonaventure, or an effect in the mind taking the form of a unique concept or univocal concept of being in SCOTUS. And then, uh, so Father Peter, he, so the reason he's laying out the univocity of being in SCOTUS here once again is because he wants to see how it's present in Colby's thought. So a big part of this book is Father Peter laying out Bonaventure and SCOTUS's teachings, whether it's on the univocity of being, whether it's on uh, absolute predestination of Christ and Mary, whether it's on the structure and method of theology, and, and showing how Colby utilized these teachings in his own presentation. That's what I'm gathering, is that's the, the fundamental part um, of this book. And so uh, the way in which Colby uses the univocity of being, even though he doesn't explicitly use the word, according to Father Peter, the way in which it's present in his thought kind of like, it requires reflection, you have to know what Scotus' teaching is, and then you can see it in Colby's writings, but he doesn't explicitly use the word univocal concept of being. But I just listed, I, I, I repeated the list that Father Peter gave for the way in which it's present in Colby's thought. I won't develop them, uh, but just, I guess, uh, so that we're all aware. <laughs> um, but we have on the one hand, Colby's acceptance of univocal being with its disjunctive transcendentals as in some way foreshadowing the unity of the divine nature and human nature in the substantial unity of the divine person of the word. It's also present in, uh, in Colby's reference to man, God, rather than God, man, when speaking of the incarnation. It's present in Colby's use of the term transubstantiation into the immaculate and into the Holy Spirit his reference to the Immaculate as quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit, his description of the Immaculate at the point or vertex where all the love of the Trinity meets all the love of creation. And finally, in his linking of the I am of Jesus with the, or the infinite I am of Jesus with the finite I am the Immaculate conception of Mary. So in simple terms, all of these developments of Colby have their philosophical ground in the univocal concept of being in SCOTUS. So I suppose what that will enable you to do is uh, understand each of these concepts better in that light. That's kind of their metaphysical justification, or philosophical rather justification. Um, and then he, he, he has a section on infinity and I really just synthesized um, in just a couple points. Uh, his main his main teachings here. So on the first of all, he points out that there's two filiations, as we know, the natural filiation of Jesus from the Father by way of his uh, procession of gen by generation, and then um, and then we also have the uh, uh, adoptive filiation of Mary and us from the Father. And Father Peter just wants to point out that this is a true filiation because it involves not merely created sanctifying grace, but the uncreated grace of the divine indwelling appropriated to the Holy Spirit. And uh, so obviously that just requires some knowledge of the distinction between created and uncreated grace, but essentially created sanctifying grace is, uh, it, 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 it doesn't bring about the divine indwelling itself, but it's a dis, it, it makes the soul disposed to the reception of uncreated grace or the indwelling of the of the Holy Spirit, but without created grace, the soul would not be in a disposition. It would not be ready as it were to actually receive the uncreated. And then Father Peter also wants to point out that there's two different kinds of infinities. And I think he'll even extended it to a third one. Uh, I forgot, but this is the, the two main ones. So on the one hand, there's divine ontological infinity, both qualitative and quantitative. And this is relative to God or infinite being. And then there's a, a kind of infinity proper to the blessed insofar as he's been divinized. So more properly, we can speak of this as a quasi-infinity, just in as much as it's not the infinity of God. It's not ontological, uh, but it's in the order of pure perfections, uh, which is fully realized in the mystery of beatitude. So we're able to participate in the infinity of God because we have pure perfections, which by their definition are not limited and which are open to the infinite, but that can only be actualized by a grace, by a divinization in the mode of operation. And then um, to continue with infinity, um, 
So here, Father Peter goes on to speak about knowledge of the ends infinitum or knowledge of infinite being. And he's, he says, how can perfect knowledge of infinite being occur? And he says it can occur in two ways, either in the order of being via the hypostatic union or in the order of operation via indwelling or acceptance. Um, once again, in both cases, the indispensable and primary factors not created grace, but the uncreated, uh, which disposes the created uniquely. And then uh, in both cases, the uncreated grace is a form of personal termination, a divine acceptance. In the case of the hypostatic union, it's, it's proper. In the case of divine indwelling, it's appropriated to the Holy Spirit. Um, and then ultimately, Scotus relates the fullness of sanctifying grace in the human nature assumed by the word to the grace of the hypostatic union. And then Maximian Colby is going to do the same thing relative to Our Lady in terms of the Immaculate Conception. So it seems to me that the purpose of this section is just he's trying to give grounds for both what occurs with Jesus and then what occurs with Mary in terms of the grace of the hypostatic union and the grace of the Immaculate Conception framed within the context of the, do, uh, of the two divine missions and showing the similarities and distinctions. Um, and that here we're dealing with proper uh, infinity. We're actually dealing with a, a proper termination. Here it's only appropriated and it's a quasi infinity. So he's just trying to preserve the distinctions for people who uh, are critical of some of Colby's formulations. And then um, this is the final uh, slide. And you know, I, I, he had a couple other sections and I, I decided not to include them. Uh, it was, ve they're very, very brief. It's just on, he talked about the formal distinction. Uh, he had a section in there, but he didn't really talk about the formal distinction in there. It was more about formal identity between the human and divine will. Um, and then he had a, a little section. I, di I didn't want this to go on too, too long. But he also had a, a section on the basis for divinization and spiritualization and finite persons. But a lot of it's just, I think, stuff that we've encountered. And then a little section on ecclesiology and uh, sacramentology. But I just kind of ended it with this uh, conclusion just to not go on forever. Um, and this I take to be a fundamental, uh, in the fundamental importance of Colby going into the second age of Franciscan history. And... So Colby's insights concerning the Immaculate Conception, both created and uncreated, reveal the dynamic center of St. Maximilian's Mariology, as we, as we know. And for Father Peter, they also develop and complete the theology of Scotus, both relative to necessary and contingent being. So the Immaculate then functions as the Marian, or the Immaculate Conception functions as the Marian mode or condition coloring our theology. You might say it's the prism by which we come to understand fully necessary and contingent theology. It's as if you have to look through it, this uh, transparent prism to really uh, grasp all aspects of, of both, uh, both necessary and contingent theology. So for uh, Father Peter Colby's insight, is it's at once mystical and theological, uh, meaning that it pertains to the contemplative mystical mode of theology and the academic proper, but specifically what it is for Father Peter is the translation of mystical theology into academic terminology. And here's the, uh, the take home point, the big point. It's a way of talking about the ontological argument and the hypostatic union, particularly in this age, or the age of Mary, the Holy Spirit, and the church with the seventh age of Bonaventure. So this is the, the biggest point that Father Peter is trying to make. Um, and he's really trying to point out that with Colby, the seventh and last age has come. The age of Mary, the age of the Holy Spirit, the age of the church, all meaning more or less the same thing. It has come. And what that takes for our theology now, it becomes new in a sense, but really in like Augustine sense, ever ancient, ever new. And it's really uh, the doing theology that's completely grounded in the Immaculate Conception and the maternal mediation of Mary. And um, so every aspect, even uh, philosophically, not just theologically, this is why he'll talk about Marian metaphysics or Marian epistemology or Marian logic, whatever you want to call it, that, that 
every mode of philosophy, if it's being done properly, is has to be Marianized. And by extension, every section of theology, uh, pneumatological, ecclesiological, sacrament, uh, sacramental, every form of theology, uh, in order to be fully what it is, has to have Mary involved in the content, but also as mother and teacher. Um, and so Colby's insights then into the Immaculate Conception grounded in a scotistic metaphysics that builds on Bonaventure opens the way for a renewal of Francis Franciscan theology in page two of Franciscan history. Uh, and then finally, the doctrinal basis for what we call the primacy of charity in God and in creation indicates no inclination on the part of Colby to change the essentials of what it means to be Franciscan, particularly in theology and in the observance of poverty, but a deepening of these in passage from page one of Franciscan history to page two via the golden thread of the Immaculate. So I kind of just wanted to let Father Peter speak for himself uh, really in that, la in that last section, but this just pinpoints that Colby's a continuity. Um, it's not, there's elements of discontinuity you might say, but it's, it's radically continuous. It's just a further development of the first page. And it's this, Mary nice theology uh, that's at the very heart of it in terms of the uh, the intellectual so oh I had to stop screen sharing huh there we go yeah. all right. Thank you very much for that. It was a exhaustive treatment of the of the chapter. Um, I guess if if I could forward a question for some of these points to two in particular that I just didn't understand. <laughs> uh, one if. I don't know if Dr. Goff could comment on this. The term, terminology of personify, where we talk about Mary is personified in the Holy Spirit, and if that's the same as in hypostasization, with, but we talk about that, about how the, the humanity of our Lord is personalized in the Word. And so then when we talk about Mary... Does it go Mary personalize or personifies? And maybe that's another question, personify versus personalize. Um, because these words get thrown around a lot and they sort of, you know, like Chesterton says, big words just sort of blur out. And um, if, we, if we could get some precision on that. And then the second, I don't know if this might be a digression, but in that section on basis for divinization and spiritualization, I think. And he mentions three infinities. Um, one is, so one is the quantitative infinity property of God alone. But then I just, I don't know what he means here when he says the quantitative infinity characteristic of matter and the basis of its finitude. And then, and then he mentions the third type of infinity distinctive of the creative person. Um, and I just, I'm not quite sure what he means by the quantitative infinity characteristic of matter, unless it's sort of that uh, infinity of, of like prime matter where it could be infinitely many things because it's just open to being informed. So if those, if either of those questions is worth drilling into, um, at least I would appreciate it. Yeah, mute, Dr. Goff. Okay, now I'm now I'm not. Um, I can. I'll just address the first. The second question first, and then uh, could somebody just get me a page number for a use of the terms? of uh, personification and personalization because I, uh, I I can I can explain the difference but I don't want to confuse the terms so okay uh, I get 
get me uh, get me a page number and let me I'll, I'll quickly look at it. But to address this question of infinity, uh, remember that St. Augustine, he uh, distinguished between the um, quantity of virtue, which can be taken simply as virtue, the power to do good, preserve justice, or it could be a quantitative uh, power of of or describing the power as such. So virtue can be used as power, and that's primarily the way um, infinity is used in the tradition up until you get to the nuances of, or the development of St. Bonaventure and then more fully articulated in Scotus. And so you have the quantitative or the quantity of virtue, the quantitas virtutis, and then what is distinguished from the um, quantitas molis or matter or, uh, um, weightiness. And this is something that is uh, particular to created substances. And so when he's referring then to the infinity that is proper to God in himself, this is the infinity of a, uh, or the, a, 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 an infinite quantity, an immeasurable quantity, an unbounded, not an imperfect, meaning it lacks perfection, but it has no perfection um, constraining itself except its own perfection. And so when we refer to God's infinite perfection, we're, refer we're, we're referring to God as being maximally perfect in terms of an analogical use of a quantity of virtue or goodness or power. And then you have a relative infinity or an infinity when predicated of the created person. And this has to do with both its mode of operation as spiritual and then the potential for it to operate in a mode that is genuinely supernatural where it participates in infinity without actually becoming infinity. So there's this notion of um, in, in, in ever increasing intensification of that spiritual perfection, not so that it ever becomes actually infinite as God is, but as spiritual, it shares a similitude or it is a similitude to divine spirituality in a finite substance. And thus it will always actually only ever be finite but nevertheless because it's spiritual it can participate and ever more deeply become intensified in its spiritual perfection of really love the intensity of love with respect to its relation of dependency caused by the operation of god directly in the will and thus ramifying throughout the soul as a, a spiritual mode of operation that is acceptable to God. So you then take on not a natural mode of operation in terms of a spiritual power with certain limitations created by the um, reality of finitude, but especially the process of knowledge, especially quidditive knowledge or knowledge of species or kinds, you know, I know a dog, I know a tree, through sensory experience and abstraction, rather through the gift of the spirit that is the created grace of the spirit that disposes one to union with the spirit, the uncreated gift, there is a, a, a quasi infinity attributable to that. And that is precisely the order of grace in terms of a hierarchy of persons and also a grade of perfection of the person being hierarchized. And so there's a relative infinity in terms of mode through the operation of grace. And then finally, that third notion has to do with the point you make about prime matter being uh, potentially uh, in, in, an infinite number of material substances, right? But I think more fundamentally, if you look at uh, Bonaventure, and Scotus makes the same point, although obliquely in his um, discussion of Christ in the third book uh, of the Ordinatio around questions uh, 12, 13, 14, he uses the same distinction between the quantity of virtue and the quantity of mass or, or, or uh, weightiness. And this quantity of molis uh, essentially refers to finite beings in terms of their materi materiality, in terms of increase or diminution. So in this sense, a, a, a quantity of molis can be called potentially infinite in terms of its potentially infinite augmentability. You know, something, something finite, a material entity can always be increased or decreased in a potentially infinite way, but it never can actually reach a term of perfection in the mode of a spiritual pure perfection, which has a, its own proper form, just like love is just simply love. 
and that can be intensified. But love itself is a spiritual perfection that pertains primarily in the first place to God, who is infinite being. So in that sense, the creature can have the quality or the perfection of love. And that's just simply a, a ratio wherein there is a one-to-one -one similitude of the creature to God insofar as that creature has that perfection, but that the intensity or the measure of that perfection in the creature will never become actually infinite, but because it's spiritual and it's able to be intensified by the operation of the Holy Spirit through grace, and divine acceptance, there is uh, a, an ever deeper intensification of that spiritual perfection. Whereas when you're talking about the quantity of molis, there is no proper end of its perfectibility or its uh, diminishment. And so Bonaventure and Scotus following him, but Bonaventure makes this clear in question four of his disputed questions on the day mystery the, the, the De Mysterio Trinitatis, the disputed questions on the mystery of the Trinity, he makes this clear that when you're speaking of a quantitas molis as opposed to a quantitas virtutis, you're talking about something that simply lacks an end. It cannot achieve an end. And so this is the third kind of, 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 of infinity that's being spoken of, and it shows the relative imperfection of the creature as a vestige as composed of matter and form, insofar as that the material component of that creature can never reach an absolutely perfect form or an absolutely perfect state or intensity with respect to the spiritual reality that is God himself or the spiritual reality that is the perfections in which we mirror God at extra in terms of being the image moving into the similitude. So that's that's the third form. And in Bonaventure's discussion, I provide some discussion of it in um, term in uh, the, the book. And then uh, with respect to that question, um, do you have a do you have a page number, a citation, the first question about per personification and personalization? <laughs> Yes. Um, let me, I'm trying to see which. Forgive me, it's all is... over. It's all over Father Peter's text, but I just yeah. don't want to get so, get confused. Two, I think two particular points, 175 or then 160, they both, both terms uh, yeah. where they both appear person, personification, person, um, uh, where, where are we at? What, much what more common. Um, so let me. So personification is kind of towards the bottom of page 175. It's, it's right by the number two, the Holy Spirit quasi incarnate by indwelling. And then there's parentheses yeah. personification in another person. Okay. Personification in another. Okay. Pers uh, but okay. There's also, so there's that. So yeah. So 175 for personification, yep. but then uh, both personification it also shows up on 63 and then two Age uses. 63. And then on 62, there's two uses of personalize. Can I just um, add something on what uh, Dr. Goff just said? Um, because on the infinity of charity, just one word, because I, I just read it uh, a few steps before. And uh, there's a question where um, they ask utrum caritas ogetur in infinitum. Is it possible that the charity uh, infinitely increase? So St. Thomas is answering positively, mm -hmm. say, saying that the participation to charity uh, infinite of the Holy Spirit is possible. So um, it's not limited in his terms and not limited in its subject because being a gift supernatural gift to the creator it's increase the capacity to receive it, receive it, to receive it in the measure in which it gave itself so i found it very interesting that in on the same um, topic we can talk about the grace as um, a gift that will increase infinitely so by, for eternity, 
And at the same time, our powers, or what I understand on that, uh, my will, for example, my intellect, they can be informed by this charity, but they will never be um, a, an infinite will as God has an infinite will. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's a that's an inter interesting and important discussion. And maybe we could uh, take that up next week because Scotus does actually have uh, his own explanation in uh, the same section of the Ordinatio that I already mentioned. And his analysis is slightly different. He will say that because, because there already is, as form is to matter, there already is a, 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 a priority, at least in terms of origin, relatively speaking, of matter to form, right? Matter is presupposed in terms of its information, even though the form is perfecting of the matter and specifying of the matter. Thus, the form cannot be um, increased in its formality with respect to matter by adding more form. You see what I'm saying? You would either have to add a different form or the form itself would um, undergo a change and then you would have a question of the stability of the form. Scotus uses that same kind of analogy with respect to the human nature, which is the the logical or structural presupposition for grace. And so when grace or charity, because Scotus identifies the two, when grace or charity is informed in the soul or, or is infused in the soul of the human nature of Christ at his conception, it just simply has the form of grace. Now it's, it is the most perfect and intensive form of grace, but nevertheless, because the form of grace itself has a certain ratio, that doesn't allow in terms of the grade of perfection, a kind of augmentation. You see, so it's not as though by by the same grace, by the same charity, you can get more and more and more charity, according to Scotus, because because the 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 charity that's infused is simply charity at the outset. Now the distinction I think that comes in, and you, this comes up in some Greek fathers, and actually Saint Maximilian affirms that this charity can be um, intensified eternally, because there's always an asymmetrical relation between the soul of Christ, who is at the apex of all grace, right? He's already established as the head and the perfect recipient of grace, because he receives the grace of the Holy Spirit directly from the Father. And um, he is the the Father gives the Spirit to Christ without measure, as John chapter 3 says. And so in that respect, the grade of Christ and the grace or charity of Christ is not able to be augmented simply because it's the perfect grace already given in terms of the, uh, the form infused in the soul of Christ. But nevertheless, when Scotus is discussing a form, like for the example, he uses the example of blue. You know, if you draw one line of blue on a wall, well, the formal ratio of that blue may be perfectly blue, right? But if you draw that line over the, another line of blue, with a crayon or a piece of chalk over that same line of blue, it still has the formal ratio of blueness. It's still perfectly blue, but it's more intensely blue. You see what I'm saying? You see the, the kind of analogy SCOTUS uses? So you can have an identity of form and you can have a perfect stability and establishment in a grade of perfection, but nevertheless, intensively, that perfection, like continually drawing blue over itself, that blueness can become intensified. And I think that's something that the, uh, the Greek fathers like St. Gregory of Nyssa and also St. Uh, Maximus Confessor, as well as St. Maximian, Col Maximian Colby um, understands. And it's really an application, I think, of Scotistic principles while preserving the insight, the metaphysical insight of Scotus that with respect to charity and the human nature, the human soul, the human will, it just simply is what it is in its perfection at its outset in constitution. But using that same logic of the form becoming ever more intensely what it is, because the, again, you're always in this asymmetrical relation between finitude and infinitude. And we will never exhaust God and we will ever more um, eternally or everlastingly progress in terms of our intensity of loving God. There's no limit to which we can love God. So I think uh, what we can say, addressing both St. Thomas and Scotus on this point, because they both make valid points, 
I think St. Thomas misunderstands the nature of grace as, as an accident, and I use that word in quotes, um, and Scotus is correct about the, the, the theological and metaphysical point. Nevertheless, because of this asymmetry and this relative potentiality in the finite created grace that Christ possesses, that can ever be more intensified in terms of that, again, that same blue being drawn over and over again. So it becomes ever more intense and deep, even though it has the formal perfection from the outset. And in that sense, in terms of the grade of perfection, it can't be augmented, or the grace itself can't be augmented, like becoming more grace or different grace. But nevertheless, that grace can intensify. <clears throat> and I, you know, I haven't worked it all out, but it seems to me that both, both are true. And they, they, there, there has to be not this kind of static existence, because we're always, as finite, ever moving more deeply into uh, the infinite being of God and the, the perfect communion of the of the three persons of the trinity um and then uh where what so i it maybe maybe that's clear i i'm whoops i'm going to have to uh run here in just a minute uh, but i wanted to answer that or i wanted to get to that question so what do you have you have a personification and personalization right those are the two terms uh you're on mute brother still on okay go. yeah yeah um, okay, I, I, I know the, the, the difference, and I, I mean, Father Peter uses these terms. So personification has to do with the act through an identity of wills, rendering a created person, making personificare or facere, making this person, making, there's an act of creation, right? The uh, making of a person. And so you have these two um, seemingly contrary positions. How do you make a person? Well, that person has to be created. So if you're going to make a person, you can't be meaning this term literally because it already presupposes a person, but the person itself must be created, right? And so when he says personification, Mary is the personification of the Holy Spirit. What this means is Mary is made like the Holy Spirit. So the, the, the disjunct or the relation rather of charity and efficient causality is manifested in the formal identity or the similitude, the total conformity in the obedience of faith, perfectly infused by the charity of the Holy Spirit in Mary's perfect created personal will in correspondence or in obedience to the will of the, of the Holy Spirit. So this personification means that Mary is the created person most like or most manifesting the personality of the Holy Spirit, which is charity, the bond of charity, right? But the personalization of, of a nature. So this respect, this in this sense, it personification renders the created person with its entire nature and all its powers becoming more like a divine person. But personalization, that refers to a nature. And so the perfect personalization of a created rational nature is the assumption of the humanity by a divine person, because it's making that created human nature a divine person by dint of the relation of the unique relation of dependency that that human nature has on a divine person. So the human nature of Christ is perfectly personalized in being assumed because it's made a divine person and thus it's made a created rational nature a perfect person because perfect personhood is only only established in the Trinity. You see what I'm saying? And whereas personification is actually making the created nature or personhood most like a divine person in terms of um, union of will and then the similitude of, of, of um, memory, understanding, and willing that mirrors in a, in a pure creature the Holy Spirit. Okay, I think I understand where my confusion or uniting of the two came in. Because I think at one point, um, I could share where he speaks of this really quick. Um, can you all see that? Yeah. 
Yeah. So this, this is, this is where it seemed like it was touching both of them. I don't know if he was making the analogy between sort of, you have at the level of being, you have this, uh, the termination of the humanity in the divine person of the word. Yeah. Um, and then using that as an analogy for then, you know, natural, um, natural sonship as, and then analogously adopted. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, there's the, the quotes around personalized here. So he's sort of speaking both about being operational, both by the word. So, this is where he's talking about chastity mm-hmm. as the moving of knowledge into charity. Mm-hmm. And so I think what he's talking maybe there about is uh, um, well, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's talking, he's talking about the, the propriety, the, 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 the human nature of Christ as being the proprium of the divine person of the word. So with respect to the human nature of Christ, to for that human nature to be a perfect person, there must be a perfect forgetfulness of self. And this, in fact, is what occurs in the human nature of Christ. Why? Because the Father is always speaking. I mean, the Son is always speaking the words of the Father, and he can do this in a perfectly personalized way because his human nature, his created nature, the being of his humanity, is a proprium in a unique relation of hypostatic dependency upon a divine person. Whereas any created person, there is a relative independence Mm -hmm. because their being terminates in itself and thus becomes a finite, imperfect person, not a perfect person in its, not in its created nature, terminating in a dependency upon the independent existence of a divine person this is it's rather confused but i but this is what's going on is that the humanity of christ is perfectly personalized made a person precisely in the assumption of that very humanity by a a divine person as unique appropriate but every created person cannot be a proprium Mm -hmm. of a divine person because there's an independent termination of that finite existence and so they cannot be personalized in this perfect sense, but they can approach it in a participatory way through charity in being personified or, or, or um, through the process of personification, making that person more like the divine person through their operation of the spirit and, and thus through the appropriation. And the, to, to show that, I guess, now that I want to look at it, he then, after talking about this, makes a reference to the trans, transubstantiation into the immaculate and into the Holy spirit where at other points he talks about that under the terms of personification. Yeah. I think that's what's going on. Um, I I think he does use the terms as distinct, fairly consistently. And if he doesn't in a place here or there, and I I don't have knowledge of this, you'd have to catch that. um, Then it's just the either, either he or (laughs) we as uh, the editors were, were nodding at the wheel. But that's that's the that's the meaning of the term. One is okay. um, by by um, appropriate, and the other one by is by appropriation. So one is a unique property, and the other one is an appropriation that can be shared in common, although nece- although still in a hierarchical order. All right. And I, I, you know, I, I enjoyed, uh, I'm sorry, I have to run, but I, yeah. I very much enjoyed Andrew's uh, presentation. I thank him for uh, doing uh, such a good job and helpfully explaining some of these things. Uh, per- perhaps at the beginning of uh, next week, uh, there were just a few points I wanted to touch upon. It would maybe take 15 minutes um, and maybe uh, make a few distinctions that help clarify uh, St. Bonaventure's presentation and then uh, Father Peter's. And these are, these are specifically uh, with respect to the notions of judgment and contuition, um, and then um, the distinction between presence and influence with respect to uh, the, the divine illumination and um, the operation of the created image in a state of grace or as a similitude. So uh, that really the, the notion of being as metaphysical and how we 
understand it being uh, content less, relatively speaking, with respect to there's no abstracted species. We're not abstracting from anything, but nevertheless, it's not empty of content. It's not devoid of intelligibility. And so uh, I think just touching uh, on a couple of those things will help us uh, understand uh, with a little bit more, just a slightly bit more uh, precision uh, what's going on there. But overall, I thought it was very excellent. This, is, this will be very helpful. And I you know, thank you again for all the hard work. It's not easy. No, thank you, Dr. Goff. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely uh, definitely open to whatever corrections or precisions. It, it's it's definitely challenging content for me, especially because I don't have a totally sound working knowledge of SCOTUS. So I'm stretching myself a bit at times and trying to, <laughs> trying to pretend I know more than I do, you know? <laughs> no, well, I think that's what we all do in theology. And that's why we thank God for grace. And, and our yeah. latest teacher, you know, she'll, she'll be forgiving uh, we, when, when we make mistakes. But, you know, my method is to, uh, you know, if somebody makes a slight misstatement, which, you know, I do myself all the time, I'll just state it again differently. And so, okay. you know, we just kind of slide into a correction without it being a correction. <laughs> all right. Uh, Anyways, so then next week, it looks like we'll open up with Dr. Goff giving some of those precisions and then move more to the discussion of Father Joseph Pio's yep. reading of the article on Rahner and then yours on Patri Passionism. And if I have if I have time, I'll try to look at the uh there's the um signum magnum. Virgo Virgo uh, yeah Virgo Virgo Mater Signum Magnum. Signum magnum. Okay, that touches yeah. on some of the same points. The unpublished yeah, I, work. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it goes into some of his critiques of transcendental uh, Thomism with with not the specified I that uh, his article on Rahner mm. and the Trinity. Uh, it's more of the philosophical issues. So, yeah, these these three, the, the Neopatropashianism, that first section is, is, is very helpful in kind of clarifying uh, what his concerns are about uh, certain modern philosophical and theological movements. So, yeah, I look forward to that discussion as well. And so next week we plan on just uh, discussing these ancillary texts. And then yeah. the following week after that, we'll, we'll look at chapter eight. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, reading reading the, um, the article on Runner, it's everything about Kant. So it's, I mean, I'm not prepared on Kant. I hate Kant, but okay, we're going to do it. <laughs> but it's just that... Uh, even the vocabulary, I mean, if there is an explanation on Kant, we, we should deal with his vocabulary, and that's not easy, but we'll try to do our best. Yeah, yeah. You know what I can do is I can, uh, at the very least, uh, send some short pieces that are that are going to be published in volumes eight and nine, and then also in volume five. They're, they're quite short, where Father Peter provides his own understanding of Kant and explains why Kant is so persuasive even if um, subject to error uh, in this sense. So Father Peter says, Kant's a, Kant's a serious philosopher and needs to be reckoned with. He can't simply be dismissed. Okay. And, um, you know, so that's, that's very important. The article is very clear and he has done a great job um, as always, but Father Peter is very precise on the terms because I, I read some books on, of my teacher of Gregorian, which are uh, Kantian theology. But very clear, you know, very precise. And so when you deal with Father Peter, it's so deep, it's so deep. Yeah. And it's, a, it's a question of the knowledge, a thematic knowledge. So it's yeah. something very special. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all. And uh, Father Joseph, would you uh, close us in a word of prayer? Yeah. Um, just wait a second. The Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his face to you and have mercy. May he turn his countenance to you and give you peace. The Lord bless, bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you. Amen.